not a very well known in a long time. And if I look into textbooks also nowadays, I still think I'm left in the 19th century with certain uh, ideas and certain interpretations, like this lovely interpretation of a rather like colony that uh, well, we know now is completely wrong. It was done by uh, Rudolf Hund, very well known in Germany uh, as a Rastelite specialist, but it has nothing to do with a uh, real Rastelite. Uh, so, and the same thing is true with the Rastelite treatises that have been published uh, 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago, giving us the last comprehensive overview of Rastelite fauna. Obviously, since that time, a lot has happened. A lot has changed, and we understand rastelites now in quite a different way. So, actually, we started to do something new, and we started to revise the phrases and revise the understanding that we have of rastelites. <coughs> so, if you look at recent literature, we suddenly find ourselves in the situation that we actually have living rastelites like this, Rastoflora. Rastoflora is a tiny little extra organism, colonial organism in all marine environment, and we now know that this is a rastelite. Why do we know that? We actually have done statistic analysis, and the statistic analysis that has recently been published shows that the pterobranch and rastelite have since quite a while being referred to the pterobranch ter as the second group. Uh, we can now see that the pterobranch actually should be differentiated in a different way. We have one group here that includes the modern cephalodiscus, and we have the second group that is we call now the rastolidina, the usual rastolite of your fossil books and uh, fossil collections. And within this, now, since this analysis we see, we have Rhoptophora, so this is the modern Rhoptophora. And if you look carefully, you see it's not actually at the base of the origin of the Rhoptolite, but it's nicely nested within the benthic Rhoptolite. By the way, the benthic Rhoptolite are probably not the ones you are familiar with. These would be the planktic forms that we use for biophotography for age dating. So we have, we can clearly show that Rastoflora is a Rastolite, and it's funny that, yeah, since a long time, I told my colleagues that, well, if we would know of Rastoflora only as a fossil organism, not from modern organisms, we would have 100 years ago called them a Rastolite. So it should not have been a big surprise, but still for, my, for some people it, it is, and still some people do not want to accept it. But while well, going on with the treatise work and trying to combine now the living terror branch and the extinct terror branch, but the life, we also have to think something about their taxonomy, uh, sorry, their terminology, yeah, and some of the nice old and well known terms have to go because we often call this a skeleton, this is a grass life fossil, yeah. Why is it not a skeleton? There has never been a skeleton because it's a housing construction. It's not a skeleton like we have an internal skeleton. It's not a skeleton that our arthropods have an external skeleton. It's a secretion by a gland on the head of the organism. Yeah? So it's just a housing construction uh, formed from what we call the flagellum or the individual flagella ring that are secreted one after another. And it should not be called anymore the periderm, because why not? The periderm obviously is a structure that comes from the skin. That's why it's called that way. And these, these terms usually come from the original notion that uh, rastolites were related to bryozoans when they first were described. And also, modern ter living terrifying, living rastoflora has been related to bryozoans at the beginning. Uh, and then we have the nice term, the rastosome for the rastolite colonies in the past, and for the modern terrifying, we had a different term, the senecium which is again derived from the bryozoan taxonomy. 
we now decided to use the term to barrier for all these things that was actually initially suggested for the subarium of Raptosaura in the 1870s by Lancaster, who first was one of the first to describe these factors at all. So a little bit of a change in terminology that has been necessary to adjust our understanding of uh, Raptolite. And then again, yeah, as I showed this wrong interpretation of Raptolite, uh, a notion to be careful on, yeah, lovely reconstructions you see on the internet and uh, that you even see in modern uh, in modern museum collection or mu museum interpretations like this, lovely interpretation of a grudge-like colony, just fake, just the stuff that we know since a hundred years is not true. And actually I've seen that in the German textbooks recently outside here in the uh, that is sold here, yeah, something like that. It's still uh, in modern textbooks from 2013, yeah. But we already know since 100 years, especially that this is nonsense. It's just a fantasy based on very poor uh, fossil records and very poor understanding uh, of rust life from the 1860s to 1890s, yeah. <coughs> so why is it so good to have living rust life? Well. <coughs> The living raptolite, raptopleura, means we can reconstruct the raptolite colony. We can put in the zooids. So hopefully, they look. They have looked like that. We don't have any credible record of fossil zooids, which is not surprising. They're soft body organisms, one or two millimeters in length, so difficult to fossilize. Yeah, but we can now reconstruct them better. We can now understand better their lifestyle, their ecology. Yeah. So, uh, quite some improvement that we made that way. And we can now better understand the evolutionary origins and uh, uh, relationships of pterodons, including the raptolites here. They are, they are clearly hemichordates. There are two groups of hemichordates, the enterocnoids and the pterodontia. That's the third group that's not that important, known from just a few specimens, plants of Severoidia. <coughs> and uh, modern uh, DNA analysis indicates yeah, that these can be interpreted either as sister groups, as shown here, but there's also a different interpretation that derives the terror branch from within the enterocnoid, and so make the enterocnoid uh, <coughs> a paraphyletic group. So it's not yet entirely settled and all that to do something with the tiny size and the coloniality of the pterograms or the reptilite. The big problem is obviously the fossil record. Yeah, reptilite can be easily preserved because of the organic material that they secrete, that housing construction, and that's what is preserved. Nothing more than the housing construction. Uh, the endrocnoids, the swan-like organisms, usually are not preservable. There may be about uh, yeah, five taxa that have been described through the whole Phanerozoic. Yeah? And even the modern ones are not very well known. This is the deep water uh, uh, taxon of the endrocnoids that's only been described in the last five to ten years. And uh, so, uh, pretty new group, a new family, a couple of new species have been found recently to, um, uh, for these groups. <coughs> the oldest one of the endrocnoids <coughs> is actually as far as the branches, which is one of the from the Burgess Shale for a long time has been called the most common fossil in the Burgess Shale. Described it was only this year, unfortunately, so we have a long wait for seeing this, uh, reconstruct, seeing this taxon described. <coughs> and if you look in the fossil records, there's still a lot of things that have been related to reptilites, to pterograms in the past. Not all of them are truly uh, relatable. We know that here in the middle Cambrian there are lots of organisms that can now be identified as primitive reptilites, but a couple of them are actually not reptilites. And uh, for it and not pterobranchia, even though they have been called pterobranchia. Gallia promosis or Hepatogaster cannot be related in any way to pterobranch. And I once said that uh, it's just suggestive labeling that relates the taxa, uh, not real uh, taxonomic investigation or cladistic interpretation. Uh, so if you call these an arm, uh, like the arm here of the 
about here, the arms and the collar, and not on the head, and the front here is clearly on the front of the head. Simple differentiation that doesn't make sense if you want to relate these things. And in that way, we'll have to be much more careful to relate these things. And yeah, uh, <coughs> we have very little uh, evidence. On the other hand, with the tubaria, we clearly see the relationship. And this is Eugnesia, a middle Cambrian algae, described from the Virgil shale and from the Wheeler shale and some other places. And it clearly has nice facelar structure and it can clearly be identified as an early terror branch nowadays. So that gives us quite some uh, confidence to see what these creatures actually are. And if we look at the statistic interpretation and analysis of fracture light, which is a yeah, difficult task to do, and it's about 5% yeah, of all genera have been uh, included any, uh, in any of the cladistic analysis of which this just gives an overview that could indicate to you, well, it's not much that we have done in that respect. On the other hand, we have a long, long experience of doing taxonomy and doing evolutionary studies on life, not necessarily in a cladistic way, but we got some quite good and some interesting information. The problem with uh, this cladistics is that now some people do the cladistics, most people just ignore them, and so we get a dual taxonomy with a nice mono, uh, monophyletic taxa, all new, barely any of the even the gratulite people know them, and we get a quite nice and well-defined number of uh, normal linear taxonomy taxa that have been found that you can find in the latest treated volume or in most of the Brachialite papers that you see published. So it's a quite difficult thing to combine this and to make a reasonable and workable taxonomy nowadays for the new version of the treated. And to give you some idea on how precise it could be in a way uh, is uh, this nice uh, uh, succession of fauna uh, leading from the isopraxis to the axonophorus, the bisteria, and reptilite. Lots of steps can be identified, and they can all be identified through fossil fauna that we can see. So we can actually do in certain groups a very detailed, very precise taxonomy with reptilite. And sometimes that's actually quite easy to see the differences, just as it gives you this, the axon of foreign can be differentiated into a group, the diplograptina and the neograptina, and <coughs> very easy differentiated is this here, the square proximal end with a couple of spines here, and the pointed proximal end with a single spine. These are the main differences that you can sort in basically in your nice little box, each of these uh, group, group uh, taxa. So it's not necessary very difficult, but on the other hand, these are nicely preserved, isolated, three-dimensionally preserved reptilites, and that, that's what we usually not have. So often we just have to flatten the outline of these types of those that makes it less easy. And well, because yeah, they are so nice, I decided to show some of these. These are some of the late neoreptines, as we call them now. The ritualitis, well known from the Silurian, that have the usual sequel structure here, so that the bar inside part of that is here preserved, and then have to have some outside of the secondary mesh surrounding the whole start structure, and then you lose the internal features, and this is what is preserved in most ritualitis. Yeah, so <coughs> quite interesting and nice and beautiful structure that you can look at. And well, at the end of the evolutional studies, then always the monograptids that we know from, yeah, the glacial borders from northern, northern Germany, for example, beautifully isolated both material. And with that, I would mm -hmm. have to close and thank you for your interest. And well, this is <coughs> for all the people who are helping us to work on the treatise. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for your talk. Um, for
Kom die in die Ja. Gaan dat die niet kort is. Gaan die niet kort. Wat is dit? Dit is de complete reconstruction. Actually, all the individual colonies that are hanging below it, that would be the individual crystallites that live separated. Okay. All these blobs and so on, on, on top don't exist. They don't exist. They're so just sanity. Okay. Other well, question? If not, final comment. Yes, um, no final comment, Thomas. The other tracks are a little bit of a environment. Homeomorphy is the rule, not the exception. Yeah. So I wonder, don't you have a similar approach? Do you do the nice statistic analysis? Do you do it? We try to do that with all of and Amazon <laughs> getting locked in homophobia being the rule, not the exception. We have a lot of problems with that, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And that's why most of the re of the classic statistic thing don't work because we don't understand the homology clearly. Uh, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so personally I'm not very happy about the statistics because at the end you have to know everything before you do the statistics. And then it just shows how to order how to put them into certain boxes. Yeah? Okay, so we don't need for that we don't need the statistics. Okay, and what I finally learned is um, all my lectures on Jeff Silva are horribly wrong because I use conventional textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I thank everybody for presenting and also for listening.